I feel like the women and the men are very different. I feel like the men have more of a hierarchy and the women, we're more like pseudo families. So you aren't the woman shot caller? I mean. <laughs> you know in your head you think you were the shit. When you see like J.D. DeLay and you I, see those if people. If you put a wig on him and put some pasties on him, I would be J.D. DeLay. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So are you, what do they call it? Female so, prison shot caller? <laughs> Ginger Wolf, who made her debut on the show early last year when I was just starting out, returns to share her compelling journey within a woman's prison. In this episode, we delve into topics such as the challenges faced by female inmates, the solitude of confinement, altercations, and the intriguing and often humorous tales that captivate our curiosity about life behind bars. This episode is brought to you by my friends over at findagreatattorney.com. If you are injured anywhere in the country, Visit findagreatattorney.com. It's a free service that can find you one of the best lawyers in your area. You focus on getting better and they'll do the rest. Huge thank you to findagreatattorney.com for sponsoring another episode of Locked In with Ian Bick. Listen up, everyone. I just need one quick favor from you, the listeners. If you could take a quick second and screenshot your favorite episode of the Locked In with Ian Bick podcast, and post it up on your Instagram or Snapchat stories or your Facebook wall, it would mean the absolute world and help spread our platform out to more people. Sit back, relax, and let's get ready to lock in with Ginger Wolf. Ginger Wolf, welcome back to Locked In. You're still called the wolf, right? Yeah. Okay, you still have the same last name. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, welcome <laughs> back. You. So, so we're, we're, this is part two, you know? You came on the show at our old studio in April. I felt like the comments were, shut up, Meg, quit crying and show us your tits. Oh, yeah, they did call you Meg, yeah. <laughs> no, they, they did really like your interview, though. They, they did enjoy it. They thought you were real authentic, and um, your clips did great on, like, TikTok and stuff. Uh, the girls. It was the girls. <laughs> Oh, uh, what, the tits? I figure if, if I jump up and down, I get a lot more views. Well, you got them covered this episode. So. Yeah, if anybody says shit about my body, I'm wearing a turtleneck next time. <laughs> Y'all play with me. Sick of TikTok. Oh, man. <laughs> TikTok don't pay my bills, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, no. They did like the episode, though. You know you got a lot of love for that. Uh, you had a lot of people reach out. You met Billy Johnson, my friend. You're at his wedding too, yeah. out there, and you met his wife or now wife, Barbara. Yeah. So it's, that's my that's my buddy. It's gonna be my niece. Your niece? <laughs> Whoa! I don't know about that. I don't know how Billy's Her gonna respond to that. Her mom loves me already and everything. You better ask him. Tell you better tell him, Billy. You better tell these people. <laughs> Facebook, Billy, man. No, it's it's cool how like the social media uh, prison community comes together and like you know. I've, I've connected with so many people. It's really cool. I actually have two more podcasts after this. Oh, fancy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Eric sent me his book. That was kind of cool. Which, uh, which so, one? Who's Eric? Eric Canori. Okay, he yeah. He sent, sent me his book, Pressure. I haven't read it yet, but he, he sent it to me. So. Eric's a really good guy. I had a really good conversation with him when he came on the show. Yeah, I, I listened to it. Yeah, it was a little... Oh, I you, listened. You listen to the episode? <laughs> yeah. No, you got to figure out who you're scoping out next huh, to connect with, huh? <laughs> you love the prison influencers. I, I, I like feeling... So... I was in the 12 step community, like after I got sober. Right. And then I I did that like hardcore for three years. And then I got into this place where I had such bad physical pain that I was like ready to take myself out either with a pill or like however else, because I couldn't live the way I was living. So I started doing the marijuana vape and I kind of found myself in this weird spot where I didn't have the community, especially because we moved. Right. Like I got sober in Destin, Florida. Um, That's where all my people are. So it, it was kind of nice. I feel like I was kind of hiding online, like <laughs> going by a different name because after intervention, so many weird people reach. Like nobody that's healthy watches fucking intervention, right? Like, mm-hmm. so I had so many weird people reaching out to me and I worked really hard to not be associated with being that, you know what I mean? And there's nothing real about reality TV. I work at TV and film now, but like I could have told you then that a lot of the stuff that you see is a situation that is presented to show the the lengths that people will go to. It might not necessarily be something that actually happened, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I felt like after I came on the show, it was almost like a soft launch of, like, okay, like, how, how are people going to react to this? Because I had had a lot of people tell me I should share my story in a public setting 
And I, I didn't want to. I never wanted someone to feel like I was trying to make money off my crime or like I was trying to get famous off of what I did. You know what I mean? Because I had a victim. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess like coming on the show kind of allowed me to do like a soft launch and be like, all right, like people don't hate me as much as I thought they would. And uh, it kind of gave me a little bit of freedom, I guess. So what do you think was like the biggest misconception people had of you once you came on the show? Because I'm sure you read some of the comments of what people had to say. Um, and and com- comments can definitely be debilitating sometimes. So what what do you what's like the biggest misconception you wanted to clear up about your story? <sighs> I don't give a fuck about clearing it up to be because people are going to argue with me regardless, bro. Okay, so the thing with the officer, that shit kills me. Like, well, so tell the, why don't you just tell the whole story? I don't want to tell the whole story again, bro. I'm not crying for TikTok again. I'm not doing it. Okay, so, so anyone that hasn't seen this episode or knows Ginger's backstory of why she went to prison, check out that first uh, episode, Relationship with a Prison Guard. That was like in April, I think, April or May. Um, crazy story. It's like literally orange is the new black. Yeah. We know how much you love that show. I do love that show. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, no we, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to like, you know, to share parts that we missed out on. We, cause we spent so much time on your childhood yeah, on the trauma. And, and the build up the trauma. I was like your therapist <laughs> for the day. I got to send you a bill for that. You still are. <laughs> um, I, I, um, you know, we, we focused on that, the addiction and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't really focus on the prison stuff. Like, we kind of brushed yeah. through it, and that was almost like a three-hour interview, too. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, a lot people are fascinated with the women's prison. So, you know, why don't you, like, take us from the top of, like, when you got there? Like, what what, what that was like, you know, walking into that prison. <laughs> so, we all know I'm not capable of giving, like, a <laughs> short story. So yeah, that, you, that's why this is great for you. <laughs> Tell us the whole prison story. Um. So I got like I got sentenced on a Tuesday morning and I was like the first person sentenced. The judge was pissed. She already knew what she was doing with me. Um, I was not in a good frame of mind. I was still using. uh, They kicked my bunk to go to prison like Thursday night. So I'd never been to jail. Like when I got arrested, I bonded out immediately. I never got dressed out or anything. Um, So I'd never had any jail experience. Right. So I learned everything in prison while I was withdrawing. It was (laughs) sucked. (laughs) not fun um you know i uh i woke up my first night puked all over my bunk at like midnight just fucking exorcist vomiting everywhere people are looking at me like i don't know what's wrong with her but nobody touch her (laughs) um it, it was just a rough first week i ended up they had to black box me because i wasn't classified right so like i got into prison uh technically friday morning uh that night, I puked all over my bunk because of the, you know, that morning before they shipped me, I brought in pills into county, you know, because I already knew I was going to prison. Um, and uh, I ate whatever I had when they kicked my bunk and flushed the rest. So I had enough in me to, like, kind of function my first day. And uh, I ended up to where, like, I was just throwing up all over the place, you know, just opiate withdrawal. I was on a thousand milligrams of oxy. Like, I was trying to die because I didn't think I was going to survive prison. Um, and uh, by, like, I think Wednesday morning, I was, like, in jail. I was like, I hate my life. It just fell off the stools. <laughs> Did you guys have those, like, metal stools where, like, the cards would slide really well? Did you have metal tables? Yeah, we had, the, like, the, the lunch the, tables, the yeah, metal yeah. lunch tables. So, We'd like, always I, play cards on those. And sometimes you had to put a um, uh, the blanket down on it to play cards. So that way it didn't, like, slide. Sli- yeah. yeah, I slid, like, a new, uh, a new deck. <laughs> just slid right off. Um, it ate shit, but they took me to the infirmary. And the inf- I'm like puking my guts out. The infirmary's like, your blood pressure is telling us nothing. I'm in fucking kidney and liver failure. <laughs> um, they ended up, you know, taking me to the hospital. I was in the hospital for like three days. I had to do a port in my leg. Uh, and then I just remember coming back and they stuck me in Papa dorm, which was like culinary dorm. And it wasn't classified or anything. They were like, go to work. <laughs> I was like, this isn't, this isn't what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> I ended up staying at Lowell the whole time, too. Um, I was low custody by the time they classified me. Um, but uh, they, they held me in the beginning because of the kidney and liver failure. I had, like, a high medical hold because of that. Papa Norm was uh, was wild. Dude, like, so one of the things you asked other people that I didn't get to answer because I couldn't shut the fuck up <laughs> was uh, the worst thing that I saw in there. Domestic violence. I had never, like, I know domestic violence is like a thing, right? I've never experienced it. 
Um, the only time in my life I regret not being a snitch was, I, su- I swear to God, um, I watched, I was in a room with 80 fucking women and watched one girl beat the shit out of her domestic other over and over and over all day because the officer put fucking paper up on the window because they didn't give a shit because they didn't want to be in that dorm. Um, and it's like a helpless feeling to be like, bro, like, you want to slap your girlfriend around once or twice? It's your fucking business, dude. But, like, you laying into her all day long just because you can't. Wait, but I thought there's there's rules where you can snitch if it's, like, domestic violence or something. That's not the case in prison. What do you mean rules you can yeah, snitch? Like you could snitch. Says who? Like, all right, if there's a child or, like, a, an in innocent In the street, bike. not yeah, in prison. So that doesn't carry over no, to prison? No, okay. no, baby. You don't get, no, no, no. You don't get involved in domestic shit. <laughs> okay. So you didn't get involved. But, no, no. I felt bad. Though. Were women she, intimidated by you? Yes and no. Um, I think a lot of, I say a lot of crazy shit out of my mouth. Um, so people didn't really know because I look one way and then I talk. <laughs> yeah, when you start talking, you don't stop. <laughs> Jeez Louise. And I just say crazy stuff. So um, I, I think people didn't really know what to expect with me. You know, so it's always a shock. It's always a guess. You never know which personality you're going to get. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably like the thing that I remember most about Papa dorm was the domestic violence that I witnessed in that dorm. Why'd they call it Papa dorm? It's just P. So it's the military terminology, like alpha, beta, you know, okay. it was P dorm. What was the experience like with your first bunk mate? Fuck, who was, I don't even remember. Cause my... everyone has like that one story with their first bunk mate, you know? So I didn't, I didn't really have that experience. Um, I mean, I was kind of out of it the first week, but I just remember throwing up everywhere. Um, right, well, once you sobered up and whatnot, you know, when you were in that first, I guess, bunk with someone, did you guys hit it off? Were you so beefing? I went out to court pretty quickly. Um, I didn't have any real issues with anybody up until like halfway through my sentence. Um, I tend to write things off. I tend to be goofy. You know what I mean? Like I don't. You know what I mean? Yeah, they called you Slim Shady. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too, too old to be beefing with another bitch, dude. What do we look like fighting? It looks stupid. You know? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So what happened with the bunk bait? With, I, I, didn't, I didn't really have that experience. Oh, you, you, you mean so the middle? Bait? Yeah, yeah I mean, a, so nothing? Nothing, nothing. I mean, I was I was in there. I went, I was in culinary for a while, and that sucked. There's no wait, AC. you worked in the kitchen? For just a little bit. Really? Oh, I got a useless pass, baby. I could not wait to use that what's thing. A, what's a useless oh, pass? Oh, no bending, no lifting, no pushing, no pulling, no standing. Oh, yeah, mm. every time I didn't want to do shit, I just pulled out my useless pass. I didn't realize you worked in the kitchen. Yeah, I did. I, did, I had uh, quite a few jobs. Most of my jobs were privileged jobs. Um, what was the job in the kitchen? You actually cook shit? No, I didn't. I didn't cook. I was on the line for a little bit, and I fucking hated that, and I wouldn't <laughs> shut up. So they moved me from there. They put me in the, the dining room, and that was a good fit for me because, like, I just I would sing. Dining so, like, room's, like, the easiest job because yeah, you yeah. just wipe it down. It's, like, five minutes yeah. after each. Well, you had to mop and yeah, deal with easy. a bunch of idi- idiots. But On like, the chow line, is it, like, Orange is the New Black where, like, you some women are not feeding other women if they're no, mad at them? Or, I never witnessed okay, that. Okay, it's no. not like that. No, I never witnessed that. Uh, you were just yapping everyone in the line. Were you giving people extra <laughs> Talking portions? Shit. I learned how to, los policias no son tus amigos. Uh, los policias esta, están confundidos. Ellos no pueden contar. You know, the lucky. police are confused. They cannot count. <laughs> you're, you're lucky you're a well-built woman because if you were the way you are with some of these, they would have looked at you as prey. Yeah. They would have been no, on you. No, not me, baby. They would have been on your ass, Ginger. <laughs> I had money, too. So <laughs> never, I never had the experiences you had, sweetheart. I never had anybody stealing my shit actually, actually I take that back I had one thing stolen so oh I didn't tell you this did I okay so they gave I went to medical like I don't know a year into my sentence right and they give me a big fucking boot because I have listen you a boot. like a Herman Munster boot bro like <laughs> listen like it had extra space because so I have uh, I need chiropractic care because of you know issues that I have with my neck and back so what happens is my hip will go up and rotate and it makes my legs shorter than the other so I kind of walk on my toe on that left side and uh, that's how I used it. that's how I got my useless pass because <laughs> so, I told the doctor about it. I was like look man I can't stand all th-. I was like you just call me Eileen because you know I lean over that way <laughs> but um 
uh, he, he sent me to Outward Medical. He's like, I can get you special boots. You want some special boots? Fuck yeah, I want special boots. These things suck. <laughs> they sent me to Outside Medical, which is like the men's unit. Um, so we go to the men's unit for a day. And the doctor's like, oh, it's just a little, it's just a little more. I could just put it inside the boot. I was like, yeah, do that. He's like, but I should do what's best for you. So I, <laughs> so I was like lopsided. <laughs> but they were really nice boots. <laughs> Someone stole them and used them. I don't know what the fuck they used them for, but that thing could have been a weapon. I told the, so the girl that used to beat up her girlfriend had like a crush for me. And I told her, baby, we can't date because you hit me. I'm picking up my big boot and I'm fucking you up. And we're both going to jail. Like, yeah. you're not going to do me like you do her. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Sorry to interrupt this episode, guys, but I need to tell you about my friends over at Find a Great Attorney. It's a great service revolutionizing the way injured parties find one of the best personal injury attorneys in their area. I've known the founder, Richard Hastings, for a long time, and honestly, I'm impressed with his abilities as a lawyer and how much he really cares about his clients. Accidents can happen to anyone, leaving you not knowing what to do or where to turn. Most people don't know how to go about finding a top-rated lawyer— findagreatattorney.com can connect you to one of the best lawyers in your area. Have peace of mind knowing you're in the hands of a lawyer that can help maximize the amount of money you can get for your case. findagreatattorney.com relieves the aggravation of finding a highly regarded attorney for any type of accident case in any state. All you need to do is fill out their brief online form and they can get to work finding you a highly rated lawyer in your area. And you want to know what the best part is? There's no cost for their service, and the lawyers they refer you to only get paid if they win your case. You don't have to come up with any money out of your own pocket to hire one of the best attorneys in your area. So listen up. Don't take a chance and hire a lawyer that will not properly represent you. Visit findagreatattorney.com, fill out their brief online form, and let them do the rest. The strength of your lawyer might very well determine how much money you're able to get for your case. Now let's get back into my interview with Ginger Wolf. That's funny. Now I know you're very like passionate about like the commissary cooking show that we used to do and everything. I know, and I'm still <laughs> mad I didn't so, get to do uh, that. What, what were some of the things you used to cook? Oh, everything. Dude, I threw dorm parties. because I had You threw a dorm party in prison? Oh, yeah. Dude, I, I used to steal the sunnies from the admin building because the officers would have like these parties and like whatever, and they would have leftover sunnies barbecue mm -hmm. i'd walk down the fucking compound with it and we'd like put it out on the table we did uh thanksgiving that way we did uh we did a lot of different so walk stuff. us through a whole party like who's cooking what are you cooking what's it's, it look it like it depends like mm -hmm. you know what are we doing is it for the whole dorm because we did some stuff like that where like hey it was somebody's birthday or someone was leaving or it was a holiday or i just had so much commissary i need to get rid of some of that shit <laughs> so we would just make a bunch of different stuff. We did a uh, Chinese food, which was cool. It was like soy sauce and uh, ramen, you know, the staple of every meal in prison. Um, what else? Sunflower seeds, uh, like a little sausage. We did um, tuna wraps, honey mustard tuna wraps. Oh, dude, I make a good honey mustard tuna wrap. I don't wrap. know about honey mustard and uh, tuna. They're really good. They're yeah. really good. I promise you. Uh, what else did I make? Like did a- uh, What was your best dish? Probably Mexican pizza. What's a Mexican pizza? So you buy the wraps and then you get a thing of hot chili and we had a hot Velveeta cheese squeeze and you get an onion and a tomato and some lettuce from the kitchen and you use your little ID card, you cut the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> or or you get one of the officers to give you a little plastic knife <laughs> and you use that too. Um, I had like Tupperware containers like because you couldn't buy stuff like that on canteen. Mm -hmm. So I, anytime I could cop something like that with a lid, oh my God, dude, a bowl with a lid in that lol was like, it's a big deal. <laughs> so you came in with a pretty short sentence, though. Three years. Three years, which is yeah. short compared to some of these other women with like a, a, a lot of like time. Felt like it was a lot for a of first course, offense. And it felt like it was a lot for me. But what I'm saying, what I'm getting to is that did girls find it intimidating that you came in like taking over things, like running these events? Like you were out there, you know, you were larger than life. What, was there ramifications to that? No. Uh, so I don't feel like I was running things. So I feel like the women and the men are very different. I feel like the men have more of a hierarchy and the women were more like pseudo families. So you weren't the woman shot caller? 
I mean, <laughs> you know, in your head, you think you were the shit. When you see like JD Delay and you am, see those if people, if you put a wig on him and put some pasties on him, I would be JD Delay. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So, are you? What do they call it? Female so, prison shot caller? No, like, what, what, what is it's, that? It's not a thing. Yeah, I know. You, but if it was, I'm saying if it was, if it was, but if it was, so who made the prison shot caller thing? You know, men, it, yeah, men did that but shit. I'm saying it comes from somewhere. So why can't women have the same hierarchy? I'm sure we could. But that's what you would but be. But that's just though. not what I experienced. But you would be that. If that's what you want to say, man, I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> no, I just, it, it makes sense. So, so you know? to me, so listen, for real, to me, the thing with like a shot caller mm-hmm. is like you make decisions on like who eats, who goes places, who keeps their commissary. I wasn't, I'm not You were making decisions that who's coming to Thanksgiving feast. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I was, hey, uh, like you don't want to fuck with me if you if you really like value whatever it is that you have going on. Yeah. Um, I was never the type to like throw people under the bus. I was never the type to like be confrontational. I feel like like words are powerful. Pretty good with them usually. Um I don't know. I feel like two people in general get things done more like together than if we're constantly fighting each other. Like we're not working towards the same goal. I, I still, I the, the whole prison shot caller thing is just funny though. It's not. Though. I know. I know. Like I'm saying in the sense, like I know, like you find JD fascinating and stuff. Yeah. So like, he moves around a lot. He's entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. I like JD, man. He's he's JD Delay is one of a kind. That's just like a good dude right there. Yeah. So what about like um, I know like you you elaborated the last episode about um how you made so much. You left prison with like 15 grand. Yeah. 10 or 15 grand. I was cut, have you ever cut a check from admin? No. Ever, okay, so I used to have to cut my family checks mm-hmm. because so like inmate bank, the way inmate bank works is you can only have so much money in your inmate bank. Um, and like after I came out of confinement, uh, I was in AC confinement both times I went to confinement. And uh, the the last time I actually got a DR because it was easier to just say I did it and lay down and it was to let them fucking look around into my money and stuff. But uh, they locked my account for three months, bro. I couldn't shop. I mean, I was doing it anyway. I, I, do you know what double banking is? No, you got to explain that. Okay, so, so double banking is when like, so when I was in prison at Lowell, you could only spend $100 a week. So if I need to spend more than $100 a week, I got to send somebody money that doesn't, doesn't shop out or doesn't get any money. And I say, hey, I'm going to give you 20 bucks and a list and I'm going to send 100 bucks to you and you're going to go shop and go get my shit. And then you keep 20 for you. That way everybody wins. Uh, I had to do that a lot. Yeah, we did that in the feds, but we could spend 360 a month. Over the holidays, I think we could spend 400 or 420 So, yeah, our, our normal load was like 400 a month. Mm-hmm. Plus, you could get, like, packages and stuff. But as far as, like, if I needed something that day and I had already hit my limit, which I usually did, mm-hmm. um, I would have to send money to somebody else and have somebody else go shop and pay them off the top. Interesting. So... Yeah, cutting checks was a pain in the ass, too, because (laughs) so after I couldn't move, after uh, we got told on for the cigarettes, you know, I was running cigarettes out of the admin building, uh, the control room. I used to walk in and out of the control room where VP was and my bunkie's mom would drop a carton and I would like act like the trash smell and I didn't want it. And the officers would tell me to take it and I would take it into the compound and go get what I wanted, fucking spray it with a water thing and bring it back up there. (laughs) Um... But uh, somebody told on me because we had basically had this deal around Thanksgiving with a lifer. And I really didn't want to do business with her, but I was kind of new up there. And the other girl that was up there kind of running shit already had some deal in place. But the people that worked up front liked me. Um, so I would I would get called in when she, the other girl wouldn't. So I basically got brought in on the hustle that was already going on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, we did a drop around Thanksgiving and I kept telling them, Hey, it needs to be before Thanksgiving because inside grounds doesn't work for like two or three days. So I knew the trash wasn't going to go. So my concern was it was going to get dropped and the trash was going to get taken out or I wasn't going to make it and it was going to get full before I could get there to get down to the control room to, to retrieve the, the items. Right. It was supposed to happen like the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and it didn't happen. Or like Tuesday before Thanksgiving didn't happen. Then it was supposed to be the next day and it didn't happen. And then they did it like on Thanksgiving or the day after. And I just kept telling them, dude, I have a bad feeling about this. Like, I don't want to do this. I went down there to go get it. 
and trash had been called. <laughs> so there was nothing there. So that means I have to go back and tell the lifer, hey, like, I don't give a fuck if you sent somebody money or, or her mom brought it. I'm telling you, I went down there. There's nothing there, bro. There's nothing to get. She was convinced that I somehow smuggled the cigarettes, fucking 400 cigarettes or whatever, 200 cigarettes, because I guess there's 20 in a pack, because a pack is worth 400 if you can get seven roll-ups out of one Newport short. I don't smoke, right? So it's all profit. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing the math that way, one pack's like 400 bucks. So you had all these people. It was like a dope drop, man. All these people were waiting for the stuff to come through and I don't, I don't have anything for them. Mm -hmm. But she was convinced that I somehow took it into medical and me and my buddy that was like the wheelchair orderly stuffed them in the wheelchairs. What do you mean? There's a wheelchair? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She like worked on the wheelchairs <laughs> and like fixed them, I guess. But, um, That's, so she stuffed them in the wheelchair. No, they she did it. That's what they thought. Did. Yeah. Okay. The stuff never, it, I'm telling you, they dropped it and inside grounds came and got it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it went into the trash or somebody found it, but it most likely went into the trash. So it was just a loss. But after that, uh, me and old girl started beefing a little bit and she, she slit her fucking, her girlfriend's throat in a uh, homestead. And I told her, I was like, dude, <laughs> like, I'm not finna do this with you. We're either going to fucking beat the shit out of each other and go lay down because you're not going to tell people that I ripped you off because I've, I've never done that. You know what I mean? I have a really good name. Like, even when I was down and out and I owed people money, like, hey, you're going to get yours. It's coming. Like, I'm keeping in touch. Just be patient. Yeah, I'm not gonna throw. What, what were some of the nicknames name. you would hear women be called? Like that was a big part of Orange is the New Black, like the different names. So what were like some of the names that you remember? So Bebe, that was a good friend of mine. Her name, her name was Bebe, and hey Bebe, hey Bebe. I mean, <laughs> uh, she was fun. Um, there was Tyson that looked kind of like a boy. Uh, who else? There was a lot of different nicknames. Uh, for a lot of it was it just, you know it was like a lot of different things all right so let's hear some more i mean that, that's you all you i got for right now. you only give me two <laughs> <laughs> i got need at I least mean, two more uh, ratchet that was that was the name uh you heard a lot of like the pseudo family my that's my brother that's my cousin that's my that's my auntie uh yeah that's it that's all i got <laughs> Oh, there was one girl we called Sharkfoot. <laughs> Why did they call her Sharkfoot? So, so I didn't like her at first, so I kind of condoned it. This is when I got into like the easy dorms, when I got into Delta dorm towards the end of my sentence, when I was in with all the pregnant girls. Uh, she had a charge similar to mine. She fell asleep at the wheel. They were drunk and she killed her uncle um, mm -hmm. and her foot was severed and they sewed her foot back on. So it looked like a shark <laughs> in her foot. <laughs> and uh, we told her at one point, hey, we call you shark foot. Just so you fucking know. <laughs> wow. Did you ever have like woman confess to you about stuff? Like about maybe things yes. they were going through or crimes or yes. cheating or anything? Yes. I don't know why I was a safe space for people with all this crazy. Well, what do you do there? when you when they share that to you? Do you tell you anyone listen? else or no. you, you just listen? Why would I do that? Some people do that to save themselves, get themselves out of a situation. I'm never going to be in a situation where I need to use somebody else to save me. You can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. If like, So it's hard to be vulnerable in general, right? Which is why like I use humor to mask everything because... It's, it's not funny if you cry, <laughs> you know, but um, I think that if someone is willing to open up to you and be vulnerable to you and especially tell you, hey, like, this is the charge. This is what really happened. I'm filing for an appeal. I'm scared, whatever, whatever, whatever. To me, you'd have to be a real garbage human being to go back and like utilize that and weaponize it. I, I weaponize my character defects. I don't need to weaponize yours. You know what I mean? Like. I just don't understand people like that. Yeah. I don't understand um, people that aren't genuine. I don't understand. Like, to me, like, so I've heard so many times people say the opposite of, like, using is sobriety. And, like, it makes sense in theory, right? For me, the opposite of using is connection. Because when I'm using, I'm not connected to other people. And, like, part of what I love so much about my life now is, like, I have the ability to make these, like, I make lifelong bonds with people. I don't like surface level bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, I want what, whatever type of relationship it is, a business relationship, a friendship, uh, an intimate relationship. I want something that's, like, 
deep where like I really know that person and really understand them and like, what are your goals? How can I help you? Right off rip. You know what I mean? So I guess I just don't understand the need, the want or the drive to not be authentic when it comes to other human beings. Mm -hmm. That's great. It makes sense. <laughs> I mean, but I, they always say like you don't trust anyone though in prison and you got to be careful with who you tell stuff to. But some of That's these true. people, like when you take that risk and share that with them, could turn out to be like a lifelong friend. I have lifelong friends. I have a lot of people I still talk to. And like, every time I fucking talk to you, I go through like a trauma spin. <laughs> I'm a licensed uh, therapist, you know? <laughs> You're doing a shitty job, buddy. <laughs> I'm a great. I'm on point. You're a good safe space. You are. Yeah. Um. But uh, I have a lot of friends that, like, I go see. I go out of the way to connect with people. You know, when I travel a lot. So um, anytime um, where I know somebody is, you know, in the vicinity that I was down with and that, like, you know, I've been trying to keep up with, I always make it a point to try to get up with them. Mm -hmm. um, I got a couple people I'm trying to get come on and tell their story. A lot of the women don't want to talk about it, bro. Well, why, why do you think that is? I think it's the stigma. I think the same reason why I hid online and played in sight never— really referenced it. Yeah, I mean, that's something I realized, too, is that the women are always concerned about how the episode will be titled, they're reading the comments, what people are going to think about yeah. them. I wonder why that is, that they, that the men are okay with it and the women so, aren't. So you know? think about the, the 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 gender roles with men and women, right? So, like, men are supposed to be dominant and aggressive and assertive, and that's appealing to the female counterpart. Whereas women, if you're too aggressive, you're too dominant, you're too assertive, you're too loud, it's like... <laughs> you mean like you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Walking red flag. <laughs> no, but I also think that women in general, especially the older women, think that they would never go to prison to begin with. So they kind of feel embarrassed by it. And I've realized that some women don't necessarily own the whole truth to their yeah. story and what they did, the, the actions that got them into prison yeah. because of that embarrassment or feeling, whereas men are a little bit better. Not saying all women do that, no, but I, I have noticed that men surprisingly take a little bit more accountability than some women when it comes to prison and crime. I think there is also the other side of it where like a lot of the women in prison are mothers. So a lot of... How could you leave your child? Well, I didn't fucking plan on it. That's for sure. I didn't wake up and say, I think I'm going to go to prison today because I don't got enough shit going on. You know? Oh, so you didn't do that? No. Oh, I thought, I thought that's what happened. I thought that's how you ended up in prison. I hate you. <laughs> oh, um, so I think a lot of it is like stigma of, oh, you're a bad mother. Oh, you're a drug addict. Oh, you're a whore. Oh, you're... You know, ad yeah, infinitum. I mean, society's created this culture where it's okay for men to go to prison. Right. But not the women. Women are supposed to be soft and in the kitchen and, you know. Yeah. It's fucked up. It is they fucked got, up. They should be, it should be okay. A comfortable should space. should do something. You should call somebody. I feel no, like you're I mean, connected. Like I, you know I, people. I, I think I'm very open. I have women on my channel. It's just like some women that do come on the channel. I, I don't know if they're 100% owning their past yeah. mistakes, you know. And I think the audience calls them out on that, Yeah, you know, when they, when they see things like I that. I felt like people felt like I was trying to shift blame for, like, my crime, which, I'll be honest, I didn't really expect that. Um, it kind of threw me a little bit because I've, like, the person who burned my life to the ground was me. You know what I mean? Like, nobody else was responsible for what happened, but I can only tell my story as it happen plus i was kind of processing my trauma as i was telling it to you i don't know why i keep choosing these highly public forums to to tell everybody because well, it story. doesn't feel public when you're sitting in here and now it's even more private just being in a room and you don't have other yeah. people it's just me and the guest you know yeah. it's this is a much better scenario. yeah this is this is how it should be this is how every podcast should be not it's some right. open shell right. um <laughs> where you know like you hear the echo you hear the door open you hear this and that this is you're locked in you know, locked in with Ian Bick. <laughs> like the beanie. <laughs> yeah, no, but I thought you were very honest with your Your story is cut and dry in the sense where there's no choice but to take accountability. It's not yeah. like a financial thing where you could say, oh, well, this or there that. There was no gray area. Yeah, yours was like pretty, yeah. pretty black or white. Yeah. And, you know, you said you were under the influence of what exactly happened. And, you know, for those that are listening, check out part one to, to get that, you know, the entire story. I thought you did a great job, like, giving the details of that and, and owning that, you know. 
Um, but I, and, and that resonates with the audience, you know, people are, people will know when someone's bullshitting about certain yeah. things, you know, and they're, and they're willing to, to be very vocal about it. That's why I think my platform's cool because you bring someone on, the audience deciphers whether they're telling the <laughs> truth or not, you know, I'm not sitting here judging the person. Yeah. I just giving them a space to tell their story. Well, that's all you got for me. <laughs> I just gave you a good rant right there that, that you look at me like I got three heads. So what do I got behind me? Shit. Give me some direction. Give me direction. I feel like we talked a l about a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but like, I, oh, so we could talk about like some of the people I was in there with. We didn't get to do that last time. You were in with some famous people? I was in there. So Misty Croslin. I don't know who that is. I know you fucking don't. <laughs> okay, so who's Misty? Who's good old Misty? Okay, so Misty. Mm, <laughs> so Misty Croslin, there was um, a little girl went missing um, in the, I think it's the Putnam area in Florida. So it's like not far from where I used to live. Uh, her name was Haley Cummings. Um, I think she was like seven or so, but. There was, it was almost very reminiscent of the uh, Casey Anthony thing where, like, the whole state's looking for this little girl and they're on this, like, circle run of just bullshit information. Um, basically, what happened was they could never find the body. They could never find out exactly what happened to her. I heard um, her bunkie told me what she told her. Um, of what happened, but <clears throat> like from a legal court standpoint, the case is not solved. Um, she, uh, she was in there. She had a lot of like pen pals, a lot of weird supporters. Um, I think she thought she was going to go in the YO program and she didn't. She got punched in the face like her first week. Ow! <laughs> yeah. How do how do like mom killers? Cause they, I'm sure they all assume she was a killer, right? So how do they fare in woman's prison? About as well as pe pedophiles. Uh -huh. Um, she ended up, I think, paying Robin Lungsford. Or maybe maybe she didn't pay. But I don't know for sure. I know that they had, um, like, a little click. And Robin Lungsford was kind of running shit. She was trying to holler at me when I was in the jail. I was, like, brand new. I was like, yeah, I think I'm good. You look like trouble. <laughs> but um, Misty hung out with her a lot. And uh, then she got moved because she was in Sierra Dorm, which is, like, Lifer Dorm. She got a 25-year sentence, and she got sentenced from, I think, two or three different counties, like Volusia, St. John's County, and then I think Putnam. I could, could be wrong. But uh, she got 25 years, and they were run uh, consecutive, not concurrent. So even if she won, because they were all held in, like, these different areas, even if she won one case, she still had to go win the other. Mm -hmm. So, so they knew she was she's gonna, Yeah, she's going to—I think she did end up getting some of it changed. Like, I, I could be kind of fuzzy on the details. It's been a long time, so, like, 13 years. Yeah. But, um, yeah, she had something to do with that little girl that went missing, and she's got a tattoo on her leg with that says Haley on a cloud with a teddy bear holding a heart. Looks like it's going up to heaven to me. It's all— Wow. What about women, there. like, uh, pedophiles, traumas? Were they there? Yes. So what classifies a woman as a pedophile? Is that any, someone... any sexual act with a child. So that's like a teacher? Did you have any, like, teachers there? We didn't have that. There was one weird girl that I ain't fucking like. They had to get her out of the child hall with me um, because she— Her version— the couple seconds I could stand and listen to of it was that she had a boyfriend and her and the boyfriend were like doing sexual things to her children. That's all I needed to hear. Get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> you know. Um, so what do the inmates do to her? So you don't have the the like violence on site like you do in the men's facility with Chomos. Um, it's more of like you're ridiculed, you're ostracized, you know, you can't, you can't sit with us, you know, <laughs> you can go sit over there, girl, but you can't sit over here, you know, it's more, more of that type of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was but they're not like, they're, they're not resorting to violence or anything. No, the, I'm telling you, the women's, <laughs> we're doing stupid shit. <laughs> like, Are there fights though? Like, oh yeah. I know you were talking about that other woman that got oh, beat yeah. up, but they're. They're, so why are they fighting with each other, but not if someone's like a sex offender? So because a lot of them feel like, well, if you didn't directly offend me, I won't fuck with you, but I'm not going to lose my game time. A lot of people want to go home to their kids, mm. you know, and like, dude, I did like 67 days a second time. AC confinement sucks. Dude, they take all your stuff to admin. They go through all your shit. Oh. <laughs> they did that to me both times I went in confinement. Yeah, it was, it's not fun. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> um, nobody wants to do that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. who wants to sacrifice their game time to beat up on somebody all the time? So what were the times you went to solitary for? <laughs> the first time was the fucking rap song. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, they put you in the shoe for that yes! rap song? Yes! Oh my god, I, I was working as the VP orderly. I don't can, only... can you rap the whole song? I can. <laughs> I'm yeah, not going come to. On. I'm you not rap. doing it. Right, rap us half a, the song. It's not a rap. It's a limerick. It's right, supposed so, to be so funny. I'm not do the doing song. it. Listen, I'm not doing it. <laughs> no, you do. A, uh, give us a couple lines. <laughs> you gotta give us a couple lines to put it into context. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> yeah, g- give us it. <laughs> Uh, you which one? Because I there were so many. The one that put you in solitary. <sighs> um, oh, Sergeant Vogan, I only have two years. So if you want to roll, then <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't do. It. Slim Shady is on one right now. <laughs> oh, it was funny though. It was really, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. Um, so they put you in the shoe. They for put rapping. me in the shoe for that. Okay. Yeah, well, because it so it was actually not. The song itself that got me locked, it was, I wrote a letter to my oldest brother's first wife um, because she thought I was in prison, like, getting beat up and, like, it was, like, you know, like Oz. You remember that show? I never watched that. It's it's on the list. (laughs) It's on the list. I Um, got to watch it. You never have time to watch anything. No, I don't. I'm I'm 24-7 busy. I know. Um... But yeah, she thought it was like ah, so I was like, listen, like it's it's. I was kind of trying to make it sound like Camp Cupcake, like hey, it's not that big a deal. I'm fine. Like I kind of deserve to be here. Like let's not cry over spilt milk. Um, and I said, yeah, like it's it's such a lax laxadaisal compound that like the officers call me inmate Vogan because like there was this song, <laughs> <laughs> and I got locked for that because like they were officers and they would get on like the loudspeaker from the tower and be like. Inmate Vogan is going gonna like EOS to her house on the hill. <laughs> like with Sergeant Boat. He's like they would just say stupid shit like that all the time. Um because it it was entertaining, I guess. Um yeah. he was kind of like goofy and dorky and not a lot of people didn't really like him too. So I think that was what made it so funny was because I am who I am and I look like what I look like and talk like I talk and like I wrote a rap about following Sergeant Vogan around. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what what is a shoe like from a woman's perspective I didn't realize it was the hole <laughs> so are you by yourself do they have bunk baits no you have a bunkie okay yeah and is it was it just like a small cell end. Yeah, yeah their bunks are end to end and then there's the toilet and then a little window what are like courtesies that women use in prison so you, you face the, the door you know when someone wants to change or use the restroom or you know take a bath because you have to bathe with a cup dude they never let me out of the shower <laughs> I feel like they used to fuck with me. They'd be like, Olman, get on the door. It's like, what? You guys like, oh, Olman's on the door. No shower. What the fuck? <laughs> Did you have to like courtesy flush and stuff too? Yeah, that's a thing. That's a thing? That's a thing, yeah. Okay, so how is that for a woman? What do you mean? Like you guys just flush in between? Like, like what? Yeah, as, as you go, you just, same. I'm assuming the same way how, you guys how do. How did you learn about it? Because it, it was weird. Like, I got yelled at from my punk mate <laughs> about courtesy flushing. Yeah, basically, that was the same thing. Was like, so I, we weren't in, I was in Open Bay uh, when I first came in. I didn't have like two man cells. Um, so I saw other people doing that and got on really quick. <laughs> I did not catch on about the bunk area immediately. You know how like people don't walk through my bunk area? This is not, looks like a fucking walkway to me. <laughs> Yeah, I got I got cussed out a lot with that, and then uh, learning how to play spades, which is why I love to play now because I'm really like, good at I it. I like spades. I haven't I played spades. in years though. It's I, literally been almost five years now. I hadn't played for a, a little while, but I played at the Halloween party. So it was fun. Yeah. So how's like the whole acting career going and everything? I've seen it's you good. been doing like a lot of modeling. And, yeah, yeah. I, I've done um, like I think three shoots since I saw you last time. I did two commercials. Um, I've been in like. 15 different movies and like four different shows mm-hmm. so that's really exciting we've been on strike for a little bit so I kind of went crazy with the Halloween stuff this year because I, I had saw, nothing going on yeah I saw your photos so, you had like a, well, how much did you spend on Halloween decorations I don't want to say because so listen is, <laughs> I joke a lot but like I have a lot of friends um, in the film community that are like losing their homes mm-hmm. and like downsizing because we've been on strike since March. Mm. Um, so unless you are working on non-SAG productions like commercials, um, and a commercial you might make $500 or $5,000 for mm. like two hours of work. It's, they vary wildly. 
So a lot of people can't survive on them. And for like, so like the Super Bowl commercial that I booked, which was like the first job I ever booked, there was over 3,000 people that applied and only five spots. No shit. That was the one where I was like, Trump grabbed the pussy and that's the American dream. <laughs> and you got that? Or? I did. <laughs> Dude, listen, I was so upset afterward because I was like, I'm the girl with Tourette's. This is like a nonprofit PSA. This is like a Jesus commercial, which it wasn't. I mean, they didn't tell us it was a Super Bowl. Yeah. They didn't say anything like that. They just, you know, hey, this is a, a nonprofit PSA type commercial, and this is what we want you to do. Uh, so I was like mortified. I mean, I cried. Like, as I walked out of there, I was like, I'm going to change my hair. I'm going to change my wardrobe. I might even try to change my name, but you, you actually can't do that as a felon. I paid $500 for them to tell me I could not change my first name. You're not <laughs> so allowed to change your first name as a felon? Mm -mm. Wow. I think I would have had to do it when I got married if I was going to do it. I'd, I'd try to slip it in there <laughs> since I was already changing the last name, you know? Wow. Um. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> So, like, do you have any uh, fun upcoming projects coming up? Um, nothing that's booked yet because even though we have a tentative agreement, like some projects are rolling, we have to vote on it. SAG has to vote. Um, so if it doesn't pass the vote, then we might go back to the table. Oh, back on strike? <clears throat> oh, shit. I thought everything was Pro resolved. So projects are starting with a tentative agreement. Mm -hmm. But that it has to be, like, voted in because it's a union thing. Mm -hmm. So, wow. but yes. Yeah, so, so listen, so I think we should do next year is we should do, I do this Halloween thing. Right. And right. I listen, Here no, I'm serious. Here we go. So we get like a lot of us out there, like, you know, 20 of us and we do like, uh, I don't, I don't know what to call it, but like, uh, a gathering where we all have like mini interviews with each other and like maybe we raise money for charity or something like that. Dude, I'll host it. I don't know where I'm going to be next year, but wherever I end up, it's going to be big enough to host people. So. Well, you know, the prison TikTok <laughs> community does have like these meetups every every couple times a year, you know? No idea. I had uh, no idea. We, we had something in Houston in January that I went to, and then um, I know they did something before, and they did LA in July, I think, that they, they were at. I gotcha. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, I'm saying you could, you could host something out at, at your castle, you know? You live in like a mansion <laughs> with the, the three Teslas and the $10,000 worth of Halloween and decorations. the RV. Yeah. The $100,000 oh, RV. Oh, yeah, I forgot you have an RV. So I can house like 10 people in the RV alone. Yeah, you've been trying to get me to go with this RV for months now. Come to New Orleans. I'll house you. I do. New Orleans is on my list. I Dude, wanna, I'll show get you. Some seafood I'll out there. I could probably take you to, to set. I don't uh, know what I'm, that is. Like where we film oh, set. okay. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> yeah. you cool. You want to come out there. <laughs> <laughs> no promises. Oh. I wanted to talk about uh, Marie Arrington. So Marie Arrington escaped from Lowell. Um, she, Who, who's Marie Arrington? She, she was a, a girl that I was in Lowell with. Okay. Um, she actually, she is, she was sentenced and convicted for murdering her husband. She got an appellate bond um, because she, you know, she was on bond d during an appeal because uh, they were I think they were getting a drop to manslaughter or something. While she was on bond. She decided to go to the attorney's office that the public defender's office that represented her two sons for some felony that and he got he was like 18 years old. I think it was the son and the friend. Someone's like 18. They robbed a store. No one was hurt. Like 60 bucks was taken. He got life in prison. She went up there and blew away the secretary, shot her in the office, killed her. Um, or actually, I don't know if it was in the office. She abducted her. And then then I think she shot her and ran her over. With her vehicle. And then they, she was on the run. She was on like the FBI's most wanted list for like three years. And then they got her and she died at Lowell. Um, she died? The year after I got back. She was huh? 80 years old. Oh, she, she was. Eight, she went on the run. And she, then no, 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 no. So, so that was before. Oh, okay. But yeah. So by the time I came in, I was in a Mike dorm, which is like the lifer dorm. So I had a fight. <laughs> and after my fight, they, they put me over there. Um, and I was in Mike dorm for like six months behind like the three closed with all the HO4s. So that, that, that what you guys called them? Uh, I don't know what it is. So it's, it's, it means like you can't be out at dark. You're like, you're a high maximum custody. We couldn't be out at dark either way. Oh, I don't know. I was, Wait, I was minimum custody. So we do all kind of shit. You were in a fight? I, I had two fights. Uh, what was prison. that like? <sighs> 
So I was like midway through my sentence, right? I was working in the library and I hated this job. It was a privileged job. I kept hearing every, well, if it's privileged, give it to somebody who wants it because I don't fucking want it. You know, I want to be outside. I want to be free. I'm not, I'm a unicorn, baby. I'm not meant to be inside the library all day stuck in one seat. Okay. I'm meant to roam and wander. <laughs> um, but, uh, she said something to me one day and it pissed me off and I got all squirrely. I was already halfway through my sentence like, oh, I got to do another year and a half of this shit. Um, and the girl that I got into a fight, she's a big girl. She looked like a big old vanilla gorilla. <laughs> vanilla gorilla. <laughs> oh she God. was bigger than me. She was like six foot one. She's probably like solid two foot. She looked like Shrek with a wig. <laughs> she was a big girl, but she was kind of like... I don't want to say this. She wasn't real aware or hip to like anything that was going on, right? Like, I don't know what she had going on upstairs, but I don't think it was a whole lot or it was way too much, right? It was one mm-hmm. of the two. But uh, she, I, I got shook down. It was like my bunkie's birth, my other bunkie's birthday, because like I slept in the middle. My buddy slept right across from me, and then the ogre slept on top. The ogre, the ogre slept on top. So you're leaving out all the good <laughs> nicknames for me. <laughs> um. So. Uh, there was this officer, Mr. Tom's. Uh, everyone called him Uncle Tom, and you could kind of figure out why <laughs> just from that. But he liked me. For, he didn't like anybody, and uh, he would always make us sit up during count. Dude, those motherfuckers can't count at long. We'd be at count for an hour and a half, bro. And, like, if you're following the book, you know what I mean? You're supposed to technically sit on your bunk and not move. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, every time Tom's would be in the dorm, no one would want to ask if we could relax. So finally, I just grew some balls and was like, Mr. Tom's, lay down and relax one at a time to the bathroom. And he was like, yeah. So then that became our every night, Ginger, ask him. That's a week because nobody else wanted to do it. So I started doing it and it became like routine. We're like, I would let everybody lay down. Well, one night we had a new officer in the dorm with Sergeant Tom and... I did it, and the officer was a dick. He was from the main unit. And uh, he was like, oh, so you let your inmates run your dorm? Fucking Mr. Tom's put me in the corner for like an hour. I was oh, peeling the paint off. The- <laughs> I started peeling the paint off the wall, and he realized I was doing that, so he moved me. <laughs> and then he put me by the front, and uh, he went to leave because we were still in count. And uh, because I could, you know, it's like by where the phones and stuff are when you first enter in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he walked by and I was like, (laughs) like a rabid dog scratching at the window. (laughs) He's just, (laughs) but either way, um, so he told me when he came back, listen, I know you're funny. I know you've got like this really great personality. (laughs) Sarcasm there. (laughs) And he's like, but when there's another officer that we don't know, he's like, don't make me look stupid in front of my dorm. And I'm like, all right. So <laughs> I went back and, it, you know, was basically, hey, we're not, nobody do that. Nobody do that. Sh- the next day, this fucking dumb bitch is up on her bunk. And we were already kind of like low-key beefing because she did a lot of stupid shit that brought heat. So, like, I'm going to acknowledge it. Like, hey, we talked about this. You're still doing it. Like, you're you're going to get everybody caught up. Like, that was before I had the cigarette hustle. I had, like, a sewing hustle, and uh, I did a lot of creative stuff. I drew art. I'd, like, cut up state property, make art on it, and mail it home. <laughs> it almost always made it, too, which was great. But um, he came in the dorm. He was not in a good mood, and he, you know, went to leave without relaxing us. And she had said before, hey, can I do it? Can I say it? No. No, that's a me thing, baby. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to work for you. She says it anyway, and he looks over because she's in my bunk area. So he thinks I said it. So now he's mad. He's putting on gloves. You know, (laughs) I already know what time it is. He shook my shit down so bad. I lost so much stuff. I probably lost $200 worth of contraband and was really lucky he didn't take me to confinement. Um, I ended up getting a lot of it back because I had a friend that worked on grounds and I they watched where he put it. So as soon as he walked away, they went and retrieved it for me. Mm-hmm. But it was more of like, like, you're a dumb motherfucker, girl. Like, I just told you don't do that. He, I told you he said he didn't like that and you did it anyway. And then like the next day, she, she had said something and I was kind of like trying to write it off because I knew I was feeling squirrely. And then the next day we had a holiday and the officer that I wrote that song about was actually our, our sergeant during the day. It was like Memorial Day or something. And I woke up in a shitty mood 
And I told my monkey, I was like, dude, if she says anything a day, I'm going to spark this fucking girl. <laughs> and like, we go into count and I don't know what she did, but I was like, you're a dumb motherfucker. You know that? And she's who, who, yeah. Hey, hey, everybody in the dorm, raise your hand if you think she's a dumb motherfucker. And people are like, don't do it. Don't do it. So all the hands go up and now she's embarrassed and I'm just pissed, you know, like wanting to vent. And uh, she's like, oh, you want to fight about it? We can go to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, baby, we can do it right here in the middle of account. We do not have to leave anywhere. Uh, she basically walked towards me. I walked towards her. She took a swing at me. I hit her in the face till she was up against the wall. She slid down the wall. She kicked me in my chest, which really fucking made me mad. So I stood up on the bunk and kicked her in the face. Uh, and then right around that time, the sergeant went. I was like, we look fucking stupid. Like, because people, people were shocked because, like, all the people up front of the door were like, oh, snap, they're fighting. Like... Where, where did that come from? Because a lot of times you hear with the women, you hear the mouth. The men, you guys are smart. Mm -hmm. You guys slide in, slide out. You know what I mean? But the women, they like to do all this rah-rah shit. And I, because I had never busted a grape, because I never needed to, it surprised people. And then it was a running, don't give Ginger a call out anywhere because she's going to meet you. <laughs> and it, it kind of bothered me because, like, it was so out of character for me. And it, it fucked my day up so bad to beat the shit out of another human being. Dude, she had two black eyes. Like She got a, a lay-in. She told him she had a seizure off her top bunk, and they gave her a bottom bunk pass. And then the next day, I started to really lose it and fucking bucked on my job. Uh, they told they were calling me from the tower, like, Olman, report to the library. Nope. Not doing it. Not doing it. And then the that, uh, that officer on grounds pulled me to come work for him on grounds and, like, used it as an excuse to hang out with me all day, which was fucking weird. <laughs> you're literally running this prison, Ginger. It's not. I told you, you're the female <laughs> prison shock caller. I was because it doesn't work. Like, like I'm not running other people. I'm just yeah. you're not running me. I know, How but, about that? Nobody was running the me. The concept in general that you, when you're when you're beating people up, you got power over the guards. I didn't have a choice. Like I had to do something. She gave me a call out. I didn't give her one, baby. She she wrote that check all on her own. She signed up for that. That's great. The other fight girl owed me 300 bucks for cigarettes, yeah. uh, and I knew that was coming. Everybody told her, hey. Because so when they locked my my accounts, I couldn't I couldn't check my money. So and because I had so much money in my account, right? Like when you go to scan your tag at commissary, the it doesn't it only shows you what you can spend that week. So if I have ten thousand dollars in my account, but I, I have a maximum spend of one hundred, I already spent twenty that week. My account's gonna read eighty. I couldn't spend any money at all. So every week it said. A hundred. Mm -hmm. So she would had this racket where she would get on the phone and got these like Western Union numbers that were either old or or something. But I had someone that was checking the numbers at first. Towards the end, I know she didn't check them, and that's what fucked me up, and that's why her tab got so high. And they were calling my name to move to the main unit. Because this is after I got, you know, out of confinement and like the warden had asked me where I wanted to go. And I was like, put me somewhere easy. I want to get off the annex. I want to get away from the heat. So I got put in Delta dorm with the pregnant girls. But um, as they were calling my name to be moved to like pack my bunk up and move, I'm in the bathroom beating the shit out of this girl because she kept lying. Like what killed me, killed me in was she could have come to me and be like, hey, I fucked up. I, there's no money coming. I don't. I don't know what to do, but like, I'll wash your laundry. I'll sweep around your bunk. Like, I let her work that shit off free because it was never about the money. Mm -hmm. Oh, you think I'm not crazy. You think I'm not going to do shit. That's real cute, girl. <laughs> yeah, she was fucked up and nobody fucked with her after that. She had a really lonely time until they shipped her after That's that. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you live some life, Ginger. <laughs> you don't know the half of it, buddy. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show again, Thanks Ginger. For having me. It was a pleasure uh, hearing some of the prison war stories from <laughs> a female prison shot caller. I hate you. <laughs>